Welcome back, everybody. So today we're going to pick up our discussion of object-oriented programming. We're going to look at some new tools that Java provides us for designing our object models. So up till this point, we've looked at how objects combine state and behavior, so they allow us to both store data and write functions that implement algorithms that operate on that data. So today, what we're going to do, the first thing is we'll look at some um, ways that Java provides us to control access to the classes that we create, um, to make parts of them inaccessible to others, and to make parts of them things that other people can use. And then the second part of the course will introduce today's lesson, sorry, will introduce probably one of the most confusing topics uh, related to objects, and this is the notion of a static method or a static field. Um, okay, so, and you know, I'm intentionally, like today isn't packed with material, which I think is good, um, so we'll have some time to linger on our examples, uh, to take questions. You know, again, this is a period of the course where we're kind of building up some of your abilities with a new way of thinking about how to program and how to be a computer scientist, and I don't want to rush that, right? I want to take it slow um, to make sure that in a week or two when we're starting to talk about things that are more complex, you guys have the basics down. All right, so um, you guys did well in the midterm. I was, I was happy. I was a little nervous after your scores on last week's quiz. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, I guess psychologically, I think maybe, um, you know, on, on weeks where people don't do as well on the quiz, maybe your response is to improve how you prepare, but it seems like that's the case because the scores on the midterm were actually higher than they were on last week's quiz. Uh, so here's how the last couple semesters fared, and, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily compare yourselves too heavily to some of these other groups because the composition of the class changes from semester to semester. Um, you know, and so things bounce up and down a little bit. Um, and so, it's fine, you know? Like, a little worse than last fall, pretty much on par with last spring and better than fall 2018. So, um, so good, so this is, a, this is a good score. I was happy with this. Um, you know, the midterm is uh, not designed to be easy. Um, it's designed to be diagnostic, right? And we'll talk more on Monday about how to interpret your score on the midterm in terms of what it means for how you're doing in the class and how you should respond to that information, right? Because again, I mean, the, the point of the midterm is not to put a grade into the grade book, it's not to punish you, it's to help you understand how your approach to learning this material is working or not working. And then you can have a conversation with me or with your TA or with somebody in office hours or with a friend or on the forum about how to do better, right? What can you do to improve? Um, how, you're, how you're sort of approaching the content. Okay, so again, next Monday, there's still a handful of people that for reasons of illness or something else are still taking the midterm, so please don't discuss it on the forum uh, or any other place. Um, once we have everybody through, I will release the questions from it so you guys can, can look at them and practice and maybe try to understand what you did wrong or what you did right, um, and we will talk about them in class. We'll talk about the midterm, some of the questions in class, and Again, how to interpret your score on Monday. But I was, I think this is fine. This is a good, good result. Okay, and yeah, this is why I need that stupid thing. Okay. All right, so well, the, the new topic today, and again, this is a chance for us to kind of like, as we add more complexity, we're also reviewing, right? So we're gonna review class design, uh, instance variables, instance methods. But the new thing we're looking at today uh, are these keywords that we use that represent access modifiers in Java. And if you look up here, um, you can kind of see them poking out because they're the things that are new, right? So for example, this, public. I haven't seen that before. Before we just declared a class by saying class, right? Um, we've attached a couple of these to these uh, instance variable declarations. So now I don't just have a string uh, or a, a variable called name that every person has that stores a string, it's also marked as public. I see a private one right here. And then I also see that I can apply these also to both instance variables and instance methods. So the print name and get age method are now also annotated, all right? So Java provides these as a way for you, the class designer, to control access to the information and the uh, functionality that your class provides. 
And so there are, there are many cases where you might have information stored in a variable that you don't necessarily want everybody to be able to see. Or you don't want them to access it without um, you know, going through a process that we'll talk about in the middle of class, right? So, um, so for example, the age field up there is marked as private. Now, what does this mean in practice? How do these actually work out, All right? Oh, man, you're just not going to work today, are you? Okay. So we can apply, for now, let's just talk about public and private. There are two other access modifiers, but public and private are the ones that are con concern us for now. They're the most straightforward um, and the most, the most useful to you uh, when, when you're getting started, okay? So let's talk about them first in the context of variables, the instance variables. So this is a class called person. Um, and right now, person joins together two pieces of information. Remember, one of our primary motivations for starting to learn about how to use the type system in Java and how to define our own types using classes is to build models of actual real-world information. So here, my person uh, combines both a name um, that's a string and an age that's an int. And we've looked at a couple of different ways to do that. Now what I've done is I've, I've added these access modifiers. This is where we put them. There's a, there's a convention for where they go. They go to the left of the type. So you'll typically see something that looks like this. So it's an access modifier, a type, and a name. So this says that my class person stores a piece of information that I'm going to refer to using the name name. That piece of information is a string, and it's public. And the fact that it's public means that anybody can modify it. So anybody who has an instance of a person can modify the name directly using dot notation. This is what we've been doing so far. This is how we've been modifying the variables, uh, the instance variables that we declare as part of our classes, our new types. In contrast, age is marked as private. And what that means for a variable to be private, you might think, well, if I make a variable too private, then nobody can access it, and it's not very useful. What it means for a variable to be private is that it can only be modified or accessed by methods defined on that class. So if I create an instance method here, that instance method can modify the name. The name can also be modified by, a, sorry, the age. The age can also be modified by a constructor. Any method that you declare on person can read and write from that instance variable. I just can't modify it from outside the class like this. I can't write to it and I can't read from it. So this line of code right here is not going to work because I'm trying to access a private field in a method that's outside the class, okay? Now, in a minute, what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine the idea of access modifiers on methods with access modifiers on variables, and you'll see sort of the, um, the conventional way of providing access to instance variables. So it's actually very, t very um, uncommon in Java to actually have a public variable. It's weird, I know, but um, over the years that the language has been, has been used, um, this style of making a variable public is pretty much completely um, not done, right? It's, it's possible, you can certainly do it, but even check style will tell you that this is not okay. This is not how we do it. I'll show you how we do it in a minute. All right, so a public variable can be read or written by anybody. In contrast, a private variable can only be read or written by methods defined on that class. Okay. The access modifiers work fairly similarly when we apply them to functions. Except there's really only one thing we're concerned about, which is can I call the method or not? So a private method cannot be called except by other methods on that class. So if I'm inside another method on the class, I can call print u. It's marked as private, but I can't call it from outside the class like down here. Print it, on the other hand, is marked as public. So that I can call anywhere. I can call it inside the class, I can call it outside the class. The access modifier goes in the same place on a function, it goes all the way to the left. So it's the first thing. You know, so we say public void printed. That's a function called printed. It doesn't return a value, so it's marked as void. 
and it's public. Anybody can call it either inside the class or outside the class, okay? So like I mentioned a minute ago, there are a couple of other access modifiers. I don't want to talk about them right now um, because they don't make sense yet. Uh, they require understanding concepts that we haven't talked about. All right, hold on. Let me, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to skip ahead to a playground example. No, I'm not doing a very good job of this, am I? Let's, well, let's, let's play with this, actually. So let's, let's redesign this a little bit. So I'm on the title slide. Um, let's redesign this to have a string name and a double age, and we'll mark the string as public and the age as private. And now, remember, these are our new style examples, so the code starts in the main method inside example. I'm going to create a course. I'll say this course. Uh, I'll CS125 is equal to new course. And I'll say ch25.name is equal to CS125. Actually, this doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? <laughs> How about this? Let's say enrollment. Okay, and now I'll say ch125.enrollment is equal to 100, whatever. Um, and now what you're going to see is I'm not allowed to do this. So this is a compiler error. The compiler will check this for you. So when I tried to compile this code, the compiler said, wait, you know, um, you, when you designed this class, you said that enrollment was private, therefore, you can't modify it now, right? So I can't set it, okay? What can I do here? Let, 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 let's actually turn this around, because maybe the enrollment in the class can change over time, but the name doesn't change. Um, so let's mark the name as private, and the uh, enrollment as public. So where's one place that I could set the name? So, so, you know, this sort of thing is not going to work, right? I'm not going to be able to set the name from a method defined outside the class because the name is now private. But where could I set the name? Yeah. In a constructor. So let's write a constructor for the... Somebody wandering around back there. Um, let's define a constructor for our class. So the constructor, remember, does not uh, return a value, and it shares the same name as the class. And so I'm going to define my constructor to take a name. This is my naming convention for naming the parameters that could pass to things like constructors that are going to be used to set one of the instance variables on your class. Right? You can't give them the same name, but you can just prefix them with set. So that's just my convention. I think it kind of makes sense. All right, so now what's going to happen, um, remember, as soon as I define a constructor, it's a good review from last time, I lose the default constructor. So I can't call the no argument constructor on line 10 anymore. I have to pass a, um, a name. So let's do this. And now this should work, OK? Um, there's only one problem here, which is like, so the, the name is sort of like hidden from me, right? Um, anyone want to suggest a way to, to get around this? Anybody sort of see where this is going? Let's say I want to provide access to the name, but I don't want to, to be mark the name as public. What could I do? Over there on the right. I like, I like that idea a lot. Let's try it. Okay, so the idea is, what if I make a public method, right? And for now, let's, let's do this. Let's just make a public method that just prints the information that I know about the course, right? So this is going to be public void. I'll call it print course. Doesn't take any arguments. And what I'm going to do is call some dot to print len, and I'll say um, name plus has students. I'll just print out like a nicely formatted message about it. And now what we'll do is we'll say course. All right, so that's nice. And, and so again, what happened here? I can't modify name from outside the class. So if I tried to print this, so let's, let's try doing the equivalent here. I'll just copy pasta this guy here. Just put it down here. And now we have to say cs125.name, cs125.enrollment. All right, so, so this doesn't work because the name is private, right? And I'm running code that's outside the class. But 
if I call a method that's inside, that's defined on the class, it can access this private information. So let's say I wanted to save it, right? Let's say I actually wanted to get a copy of the name. What can I do? If you're designing the class, you could do something like this. We'll call this get name. And what are we going to do here? We're going to return the name. So now I could say something like this. Say cs125.get name has. I have to close my. Oh, come on. It's, what are you upset about, Chuck now? There you go. All right, so, so, what's the, so what's the difference here? Someone explain this to me. This seems like I'm doing a lot of work. So before I just had a public string name, and that was like really nice. And now I've got a private string name and I have this whole other function called get name that just returns the name. It seems very mechanical. But there's a difference here. Anyone spot it? What have I, what have I accomplished this way? Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm, what I've done, so I'm designing, I'm, you guys are designing this class, this course class. And so what you've done is you said, I'm going to provide you a method called get name that allows you to retrieve the value of this private variable. That was your choice, right? But there's still a difference between marking it public and this. Can anyone spot it? If I mark it public, there, I'm, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite there yet. I actually haven't achieved the same thing as marking it public. I'm missing something. So right now, if I want to know the name of a class, I can call get name and I can get the name back. I'm using that down here to print off this nicely formatted string about the course. But what can I not do? Yeah. I can't change it, right? There is no way for code outside the class to modify the name, right? How would I do it? The name's marked private, so if I try to change it, it's not going to compile, okay? So now you as the course designer, sorry, as the class designer, have decided that you can set the name when you create the course through the constructor, but once you do that, you can't change it, okay? And in a lot of cases, that's pretty useful, right? And this, is, this is giving you more control. Okay, so what if I wanted to be able to change the name? What would I, so let's say I'm designing the course object or the course class, and I've decided it's okay for the name to change. What could I do? Yeah. Yeah, so remember what we did before when, when we wrote this method get name, to just return the name, so I can also write a similar method. I'm also going to make this public. That method is void. It doesn't return a value. I'm going to call it set name. It takes a string that I'll also call set name, and it sets the name of that string. It sets the name of the, the, that course object to the value that you pick. So now what I've done is I actually have a way to both get and change the name of the class. But, again, keep in mind, you, as the designer of the class, made these decisions. So if you want name to essentially be read-only, you don't provide the set name method. Right? You can also do things inside these methods. So let's apply the same principle to the enrollment. Okay? So let's mark the enrollment as private. Um, we're going to, when we create the course now, we're going to take uh, a value to set the enrollment. I'm not going to let this be set anymore. Um, I'm just going to use my usual pattern of setting these variables down here. We'll set this to 500. I have to get rid of this because I can't do that anymore. Um, and now I have to, so now I would have to write a getter for enrollment. Let's do that. Let's write a, let's write a similar function to the name that allows me to retrieve the enrollment. And 
let's write a similar function to set name that allows me to change the enrollment. Say enrollment to the set enrollment. Now down here I have to change this. Okay. So now this works again. So now I'm following a similar pattern for this other variable. But what could I potentially do? So I want to show you another way that this provides you with more control over what's happening, okay? So let's look at my set enrollment method. Remember, you write this. This is your code. When you design your, your class that's going to store data. So this is a place where you can do things to make sure that the values that you're receiving are sane. So what might be an uh, insane value for the enrollment in a course? Someone give me an, in, an, an insane number. A number that I probably should not accept. Yeah. Negative one. Let's, let's go big. Let's go like negative 100, right? So a course with negative students, like what does that even mean? Right? It's so unpopular that like, destroys students from taking it. I don't know, I don't, yeah. So, I mean, enrollment can go to zero, but it probably shouldn't go below zero. So in my setter, remember, I'm, this is code. You can, I can do whatever I want here. So one thing I could do is I could say, if set enrollment is greater than zero, then I'm gonna modify the enrollment. Otherwise, I'll just leave it. Right? So I'm going to ignore these bad values. So now let's see how this works. So let's do set enrollment. Let's try that negative 100 value. Um, why is it angry with me? Oh, yeah, I need to use this. Sorry. <laughs> Should need to use an actual number, not a string. Yeah. So basically, it's just going to ignore that. So this is one of the other things that you can do inside these functions. Okay, so what we've been doing here is something that is so common that there, there, are, there are names for these functions, okay? These are referred to in Java as setters and getters. And this is the pattern that you use when designing Java classes. Again, Java is a language when it was designed many, many years ago, allows public instance variables. But from a practical perspective, nobody uses them. Okay? Ever. This is an interesting example of, you know, language basically allowing something and then the community of people that surround that language over time with the benefit of a lot of experience kind of saying, no, 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 that's a bad idea. Right? And so this is what we do instead. We provide, we always use private on our instance variables. And then we provide two methods that at their simplest are very, very basic. Right? This is the ba most simple setter and getter. The setter just sets the variable, the getter just returns the variable. But you can also do more complex things in your setters and getters. So for example, you can provide a, so sorry, I'm using this new piece of terminology. Uh, let me explain it. So set age is a setter. This is a family of functions that exist to set the value of an instance variable on the class because the instance variable is marked as private. Getter is a function, a family of functions that exists to get the value of a particular variable, right? So get age, get name, get enrollment, these are all getters. Set age, set enrollment, set name, these are all setters, okay? Um, and again, this is the pattern that we use now in Java when you write, when you design classes. Um, if you try to add public fields, um, I mean, you can do it, but nobody does, right? And, and the tools that check your code will complain about that because they'll say you're supposed to do it this way. Um, and so again, so we have a name for these. Um, IntelliJ can actually automatically generate them for you if you would like. You basically get something that looks like this. But then you can also customize it, right? You can have them do different things. Um, it's also possible to do a little bit more interesting things inside your setters or getters. So let's look at a different, slightly more complicated example of a person class that not only stores the full name of each instance of person, but their first and last name. 
Now, if you'll notice here, I never set the first and last name. There's no way to set the first and last name. There's no setter for first name or last name. Instead, what I do is when I set the name, I split the name into two parts, and I set the first and last name that way. Now, is this correct? No, it's way too simple, right? Some of you have like four names. Some of you have juniors hanging around at the end and stuff like that. So this doesn't work, right? But you could imagine making this more sophisticated to the point where it would actually get the job done, right? But what I'm doing is I'm basically providing one setter, set name, that actually sets three fields. It sets the full name, and it sets the first name and last name as well. So because of this pattern, I can kind of play games like this, right? And I can add new features to my classes. Okay. Um, I don't know what I was planning on doing with this example, except now I have an O in there. Let me come back to this if, if we have time at the end. All right, any questions on access modifiers? So essentially, you know, you now have this new tool in your bag for designing new types in Java and making sure that people have access to them in a way that you understand, right? You know, um, we, we talked more about access modifiers when it came to variables. Excuse me. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks. Um, but you can also, these are equally useful when applied to functions, right? So, and probably more useful. One way to think about it is if you mark a function as public, then anybody can use it. It's available on that class, and so people might use it. Somebody who uses your code might decide to call that function. And so you need to be prepared for that, right? That function should work. You might need to write documentation for it, right, so people understand how to use it. If you mark a function as private, it cannot be used by anybody else. That's just for you. It's like a helper function, right? It doesn't have to be documented. No one's gonna be able to use it. You know, it should be useful, right? But it's not part of what we sometimes refer to as the public interface of your class, right? It's not something that's visible to somebody else. It's just part of the internal workings. We'll talk more about exactly how this works when we talk about interfaces in a couple weeks. All right. Last chance, access modifiers. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, great, great question. So the question is, is there a reason to, why would I write a setter versus having the variable set in the constructor, right? And so th this, this comes back to this idea of should the, should the variable ever change? Um, if the value of the variable, you don't expect it to ever change, right? So for example, um, you know, if I was designing a, again, like a program to store information about students, your GPA changes, right, every semester, your university ID number does not. So, you know, when I create a new instance of a student, I can provide the university ID number in the constructor, and then I can provide a getter for it, but I should never have to change it, right? It never changes. Whereas if I want to monitor, you know, which courses you're taking or, you know, what your address is on campus, I need to provide a way both to set those in the constructor probably, but also to set them using a setter because those things will change. So it really depends on your data and how you expect it to change, right? Now, there's no real point in having a variable that can't be set either in the constructor or through a setter unless you use it internally, right? So for example, um, if I go back to, let's go back to our example that we were working on over here. If I had a private name and no way to, even if it's set in the constructor, Right? Maybe I use it internally, but imagine I don't even have a way to set it in the constructor. Right? Now again, I might use this internally as part of my class. It might be used by some of the methods that I'm writing. But in general, this probably isn't what you want. Right? Um, because now, there's, not only, oh, not, there's no way to set the name uh, and from the outside. There's, only a, there's no way for someone to tell you what the name of this course is when they create it. Um, Maybe you can look it up somehow or whatever, but this is, this is less common, right? This idea that I have a private variable, no constructor, no way to set it in the constructor, no setter or getter, right? Good question. This, we'll, we'll do more examples of these design questions, and I think some of, these, uh, some of these use cases will become more clear. Good question. Other questions? 
Okay, so because it's almost the weekend, um, I have 20 more minutes to confuse you before the weekend comes, and so here we go. Um, let's talk about static, because I've seen that hanging out a couple places, um, and we do have to talk about it. I kind of wish we didn't. Um, it's confusing. Uh, I'm going to prepare you for that, uh, but we do because you're going to find it and it does get used. What, is, uh, what does static do? All right, so static is another one of these modifiers that I can add to either a variable, a, a class instance variable, or a class, in, a class method, okay? Um, static has much more, a much more of a dramatic effect than public and private, right? Um, what static means is that, so up until this point, our instance variables have been instance variables. Each instance of the class had a different name if it was a person or a course, a different age if it was a person, a different enrollment if it was a course. With static, what happens is that variable, there only one copy of it exists, and it's associated with the class itself, not with any instance of the class. Same thing with methods. So up until this point, remember, someone asked a great question a few classes ago. They said, can I call an instance method without an instance? And the answer is no. Before I call um, a method like, again, let me back up a little bit. Before I call a method, any of these getters or setters, I need an instance of the course. With static, I don't. With static, I can call the method just by having access to the class, right? Now, this has implications for static methods, and there's also some really deep implications for static variables. Right? And again, this is a tricky concept. But I think actually one of the reasons that we talk about static is because it really does help deepen your understanding of what's going on with Java objects. Okay, so here's an example of how to use static. It's also an example of where it goes. Okay, so you'll see here, static, when I assign it to a variable, goes in between the access modifiers, which typically all the, all the way to the left, and the type. Same thing when I apply it to a function or a method, right? Public is all the way to the left, void all the way to the right, static ends up sandwiched in the middle. Now, like I said before, uh, static has a huge impact on how variables in particular behave. And one of the things I've seen students do in this class, which I really discourage, is just like, uh, does it work? No, try adding static. Does it work? No, try removing static, right? It's not really the right way to approach the problem. Um, so, again, we'll, we'll try to, to deepen your understanding of exactly what this does. And we'll come back to this on Monday. This is not something we talked about once. All right, so a static method can be called without an instance of that class. So here's an example. I have a public class called course. It's empty. Just to show you an example, I've declared a static method called print name that just prints a string. You'll see now on line nine, I can do this. So this now works. I have not created an instance of the class. I only don't do that until line 11. But on line nine, I can use the capital, I can use the name of the class, which is capitalized, dot notation, and then print name. So class methods can be called without an instance of the class. Now if I have an instance of the class, I can still call a class method. So this also works. So on line 11, what's happening? I'm creating a new course using the empty constructor. So far, my class doesn't have any instance variables or methods, or maybe they're not shown. I save that new course in a variable called CS125. So now I have an instance of a course. I've created a, there is a course object. There's an object of type course that exists in my program. I can still call static methods using the variable that contains the instance of that course. But the most important thing to see here is that this works, right? Without an instance of the class, I can still call this static method, all right? Um, here's the implication. Right, so you might be wondering, what's different about static methods? Because static methods can be called without an instance, they can't access instance variables. That makes sense, right? So this is an instance variable. This is what we've been looking at so far. It's a public instance variable. It stores a string into a variable called name. 
every instance of a course will have a name that I can access using dot notation, and the methods on the instance methods that I write on my class will be able to access that. The static methods cannot. So I can't do this, right? And so, again, I hope we have a, a playground example to look at in a minute. Uh, here we go. Okay, so let's, let's do this and then we'll come back, right? So I just want to use the static method here. Let's just do this. Let's try to access that static, that instance variable. And we'll do a course, give it a name, and we'll try to do cs125.printName. And so you'll get a compiler error if you try to run this code. And this, this error explains what's wrong. It says non-static variable name. Name is an instance variable cannot be referenced from a static context. I'm trying to reference it from a static method. And this makes sense to some degree, right? Because, uh, well, let me, let's do it this way. Imagine that I call print name. So this works, right? So I want to distinguish between these two examples. This works, okay? Why? because it doesn't access any instance variables, right? The only, there, there's no, it's not trying to access name or any other instance variables that I might have defined on the class. This will work fine. And you'll see there's no new anywhere here. I've never created an instance of the class. I'm using the class directly to call this static method. As soon as I replace this with an attempt to access an instance variable, it will fail, okay? And so if you can understand the difference between these two examples, where here I'm printing any string literal, it doesn't have to be name, it can be anything, right? This will work. Any attempt to access any, let's make a set enrollment as well, like we did previously. As soon as I try to do this, it will not compile. Now, what's confusing about this even more than it's already sort of confusing is that, what about if I do something like this? I say, course, new course, and then I, pr I provide a name, and then I try to do, and let's replace this with name so it matches the definition. It doesn't matter. Okay. Because static methods can be called without an instance of the class, they can never access instance variables. Okay, so this is one of the most important things to understand about static methods. Now, why do they exist? Anybody have, a, have an idea? Like, th these don't seem that useful, and yet it turns out that like, there are lots and lots and lots of static methods that you probably end up using in Java all the time when you're working in language. Why? Oh, okay, well, let's not talk about static variables. Let's talk about static methods. Static variables, I think, are even weirder, but that is a good example of when to use one. Static methods. Why would I have a static method? When, when is this ever useful? Is it ever useful? Well, give me an example of something that seems like it should be static. Yeah. Yes, well, string operations actually operate on the string data. So those are not static, but, yeah. So that's one example, right, is that I, I need to be able to find a main method. We can talk about that one more. But I'm thinking about whole categories of examples, right? Anybody want to take a guess? There's whole packages in Java that you can use as part of your programs that are all static methods. What's in one example? Yeah. Yeah, so like, for example, let's say I just want to do some math, right? I just want to call... Um, see here, uh, math dot, is this an actual function? Let's find out. I'm still angry about this. I'll get rid of that. Oh, I have to print it. Okay. 
Yeah, so math. It's just math. I don't want to have to create like a math object. There's no new here. This is just a method, right? Now, it still takes arguments, so I can still pass arguments to my static methods, but if I have um, examples of this, like utility functions, that don't really need an object to work, they're just operating on a number, right? Like, you know, how, how annoying it would be if every time I need to take square root, I would have to create like a new math object and initialize it and then call this method. No, I just, so math.square root, that's why it's capitalized, right? So that's why all the math methods that you can use are capital math.square root, they're all static methods. Math has no non-static method, there's no instance methods. There's no way to create an instance of the math class. We'll talk about how you can do that in your own classes in a week or so. Right? So this is Java's approach to kind of library functions that are provided in other languages. Remember that in Java, everything has to be inside a class. The language is very, very persnickety about that. I can't just write a function. I can't just write square root and just have it work. It has to be inside a class. So when I have functions that don't need, you know, an object context to work, I just set them up as static functions, and Java has whole libraries that consist of a class with all static functions. Right, the math class is a great example. There's a lot of useful stuff in there, actually. All right, good, so there's, there's an example of static methods. Now let me talk about the one that's even, I don't even know why we talk about this. Maybe I should stop talking about static variables, all right. Um, so I can also mark a variable in my class as static. And this is like probably even less common than static methods. So I just explained one of the main purposes behind static methods, and they do get used that way a lot. Static variables, I am suspicious of you if you are using a static variable. I suspect that it's probably not going to accomplish what you want. It might. Somebody raised one of the best cases for static variables a minute ago, but they are very, very uncommon. But here's how we do it. So on line two, I'm declaring a variable called int, sorry, called count, it's an int, it's public, and it's static. So what does that mean, all right? Well, first of all, I can access a static variable in a static method or in any instance method. It's available to all the methods on my class. Now, let's see what happens here. So um, what, what's gonna happen with the count is that every single instance of class shares access to the same variable. There's only one count. There's not one count per instance of the class. And so for example, if I do this, um, and actually, I'd, uh, and, I, and I change the count, then both of the instances are gonna print the same value. So now let me go back to my, yeah, here's the problem. I ruined this example, so let me reload it. Okay, that's better. So now I've got a static count that I initialized to zero. And now let's do something else. Every time we create a new course, we're gonna increase the number of courses. And then I'm gonna call print count here. Okay. So again, what is happening here? First of all, let me point out something. Even before I create an instance of a course, I can still print the count. So a static variable is available before I've created any instances of the class, and it'll be available after I'm done using all the instances of the class. It's always there. There's only one count in your entire program. There's not one count per course. And so what you'll see happening is in my constructor, I'm incrementing the count. So on line 15, I create a new course, the constructor runs, the count was zero, now it's one. Down on, and then I print it, okay? My print method accesses the one copy of count that exists in my program and prints it, it's now one. Then, down on line 17, I create another new course. The count was one, it goes to two. And then I pr use the print methods on both of my course instances to display the count, and you'll see that they display the same value. So this variable is being shared. If any instance of course increments it, everybody sees the new value, right? Okay, so again, this is one of the few use cases for static variables. And if you add, so, and, and like, I, like I was saying before, if you accidentally, I've seen this happen. You know, again, I, people come and they show me, oh, I, I missed this problem on the quiz. 
Um, I wish I had like a nickel for every time somebody had added static to a variable. I don't know why. And it, it, it would cause their program to do something completely different than they want. And the, the, the solution was just get rid of static, and then it works. So it's very unlikely that you're ever gonna need to do this. I think we have like a homework problem where we make you do it, um, but past that point, it's very, very rare that you're gonna need to, to, to do this, right? There are a couple of use cases for it, but it's not common. It's much more common to see static methods. All right, I think I am out of time for today. Um, we'll come back and finish this up on Monday. The access modifiers work for static the way you would think they do. Um, so as a reminder, the MP1 early deadline is Sunday or Monday, depending on your deadline group. Um, good luck finishing that up. We have office hours all weekend as usual. Um, I will see you all on Monday, and we will talk about the midterm. <laughs>